big congrats to John Rahm, who has now qualified for the Century Tournament of Champions. Time now for Champions Chats, presented by Century Insurance. And as you heard, with the victory, John Rahm has ascended to the top of the official World Golf Rankings for the first time in his career. He becomes only the second Spaniard ever to reach world number one, following in the footsteps of his childhood hero, Seve Ballesteros. So, Robert, I'll begin with you. How significant is this milestone in Rahm's career? Uh, it's obviously one of the biggest things in the world. Uh, there's only a handful of players uh, that have gotten to number one in the world and to be part of that history, even if it's disputed, even if people think maybe Bryson's outplayed you in the last handful of, of well, the last month or so, or people think over the last couple of years that Rory probably would be more deserving because of the amount of wins and has also been consistent. None of that matters. John Rahm didn't write the formula for the official world golf rankings, yet he did what it took to get to number one in the world. And it was unbelievable. And to, to, I don't think enough credit can be given to him for his start. Let's say his first nine holes. He, he knew what was going to happen if he won. He knew the conditions of the course. I'm sure he sat in the inside the, the clubhouse in the locker room and watched as, as people were out there making bogeys and doubles and triples. And he had a game plan and the front nine was like Tiger Woods when he had a lead. It was incredible. He had a four shot lead and it went to eight through perfect play, really. And it wasn't until the back nine that things went a little haywire. But as he said in that sound, you can't expect um, 18 perfect holes with situations and conditions like that. But again, the how impressed I was with the way he played. And, and it makes me think he's going to hang on to this number one for a while. I think I think the consistency will come back and he'll just keep racking up points. It was a defining title, and I don't mean just uh, the win at Memorial. It was a defining title in getting to that number one in the world uh, marker. That's how players are defined. That's how we often describe them as a former number one in the world or number one in the world. So, uh, yeah, this is extremely meaningful, and I think it's meaningful that he won here in those kind of conditions. Uh, it takes an incredible amount of patience to get through a day like yesterday or a week like last week in that you you are challenged each and every shot. Uh, I think it was described by Rom himself and saying, you know, there's a very little margin. All of your misses are amplified when you're playing a golf course and in those kind of conditions. So I think there's a lot of things to take away from Sunday. It's it's a career defining moment for him to, to reach number one in the world. It's an excellent display of how patient uh, John Rom was on the golf course as well. And that, that of course has been criticized in the past. Excellent start to his, you know, back nine or front nine yesterday, as you said, Robert, but also an excellent start to his career. I mean, this is the only two-time winner of the Ben Hogan Award in college. Now a six-time winner on the European Tour, four-time winner on the PGA Tour, four top tens in majors in 14 starts. So, so my question, Robert, is what's the biggest challenge for him going forward? Because not everybody is comfortable at the top of the mountain. Uh, McElroy, Kepka, Thomas, a handful of others is going to be the biggest challenge. It's not like uh, people don't want to take that number one away from him. It's not like that when they get to each tournament, they don't want to beat his brains in, frankly, uh, and not let him stay at number one. Um, you know, every one of these players we see not named John Rom, well, including John Rom, worked their whole life to get here. They worked so hard. They did everything they could and continue to do everything they can. There's a jealousy when you know that someone's in front of you. Uh, it's probably going to hit Rory the hardest because he just lost it. But there's a, a dislike of being ranked behind certain players when you're so great as those top 10 you just saw are. So um, Rom's going to have his hands full with all those other players. Don't, don't think they're just going to say congratulations and go quietly into that good night. Yeah, I think it's exciting for us to be able to see how many of those players are playing well right now. Uh, it's not always the case. You see some players trending down while others are trending up. And I think we've got a really good mix of players that are all trending in the right direction. Uh, but for John Rahm, I feel like we've seen kind of this evolution and, and becoming this more all-encompassing golfer. I know he had all the tools when he came out of college. Uh, even Phil Mickelson said that famously, that, that he was a you know, had all of the all the shots in the bag that's necessary to be successful in the PGA Tour. But I also think that, the, especially on the mental side, he has been criticized so often about his temper and not having patience and things like that. I, 
I think this was a major championship test. Uh, he, he was tested in a way that you would at a major championship. And that was the one thing that I think most critics were critical of is can he get it done in the majors when it requires the, the highest level of mental strength and patience. Well, it took a lot of mental strength and patience around that golf course. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and when you're in that position and you've got the lead, you know, in, in reality, everyone's playing the same course. It's not like you're playing uh, this conditioned golf course. that's so difficult and everyone else is out on, on the Muni, uh, you know, playing soft greens and, and, and big wide open fairways, but it does feel that way. And for him to handle himself the way he did, especially on the front nine, I mean, it, it, Full disclosure, I thought he was going to struggle on the front nine because of the pressure of of being number one in the world. I've seen guys get very close. Justin Rose and Justin Thomas, both of those guys got very close before they got to number one and kind of faltered. And it's just that little bit of extra pressure. So, again, watching Rom under those conditions pick the front nine apart like, like prime Tiger Woods was unbelievably impressive. You know, and one of the things as it relates to, to what I mean by patience and kind of what he displayed there in, in those moments was it's okay to be angry and then let it go. Uh, what you look for in a player and what a player strives for is that you don't let that emotion then carry over to the next shot and the next shot and be compounded uh, in errors. So I, I think that's what I mean. And, and you, you mentioned it, how well he was able to kind of stay in that frame of mind through that front nine. And, and even through the back where we did see that kind of volatility, he was able to rein it back in and recover from it. And again, that that's what I mean by patience and discipline. It's not the lack of emotion. It's the recovery of the motion. Well, speaking of rain, not to rain on Rom's parade, but had his lead not been so large, what happened on the 16th hole Sunday could have been devastating after chipping in for what he thought was a birdie Ron was assessed a general penalty, which is two strokes for a violation of rule 9.4 after a ball at rest moves. Subsequently, his score was adjusted to a four instead of a two. So as we take a look at uh, Ron's final scorecard in just a moment, he ended up shooting a 75 as the video shows that the ball indeed did move. In fact, Ron said he needed an iPad to see how close it was uh, that the ball actually moved. I mean, he was cruising along, as you mentioned, Robert, on the front nine, two birdies. But on the back nine, he openly carded three bogeys and a double bogey on the 11th hole. So, Paige, what do you make of the penalty that was set, as assessed on Rom uh, in, in general? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's obviously no denying what the camera saw and that the ball did move. Uh, my question, I think, that I was left with is wasn't this what the decision was about when the USGA came about video technology? They said that video technology has the potential to undermine essential characteristics of the game by identifying the existence of facts that could not be reasonably identified any other way. Such evidence should not be used to hold players to a higher standard than human beings can reasonably be expected to meet. And I think this kind of draws the line in the sand in a way that I don't know a lot of players would necessarily agree with, that if you were standing over the ball or if your playing competitor was nearby, that you could visibly see that with the naked eye. I think it's just going to be an interesting precedent to send, because to send because this to me was the first ruling that kind of takes on that decision that was laid down uh, a year or so ago. And I don't know if I agree with the, the ruling. I, I hated the ruling myself for that very reason. Did the ball move? It, it appears it did. Um, certainly, certainly through no fault. Uh, well, I guess through fault of his own, but not on any intent by John Rom. But but it is because of that naked eye ruling. There is no way that if we don't have that 4K camera right there, slow motion, that we're going to know. Even if John Rom, with his own two eyes, is looking down at it. Uh, one thing I hold that makes me feel a little better about it is we know it didn't change the outcome. John Rom goes, yeah, it moved. Let's just get this over with and and not fight it. But had it been something that changed the outcome or he had to go into a playoff, I feel like he would have fought it and he would have won the argument because there's no way the naked eye saw that. 